All right. Uh, welcome back. Um, no real announcements. Um, I won't be here for the next uh, three weeks, so the next three weeks of lecture will be conducted by Jenny. She's an expert on Phil Mind, so it's, uh, of course, uh, in your interest to have her lecture on the coming material. Um, and sh sh it'll be great. And then I uh, step back in when we turn to personal identity and knowledge. So um, I will be back. Um, I guess our announcements. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that uh, we're giving you, uh, I mean, just basically this is your lecture in, in argumentation and logic. Um, one, you know, 50-minute uh, session. Uh, it doesn't do justice to the topic. There's a lot of interest, intricacies. There's a lot of interesting results. Um, the philosophy department offers two logic courses. Uh, it will, depending on the year and how far you go in philosophy more, but um, two second year logic courses. Uh, one, critical thinking, which is a less uh, formal, less technical, yet rigorous um, course on logical thinking. Um, and uh, if you're not interested in going further in philosophy, but you do want to uh, hone your skills and reasoning, that's a good course. Um, symbolic logic is much more rigorous. It's a bit more like math. It doesn't involve math, but um, it's uh, a very technical course that is a really um, accessible because it's introductory. Um, and also extremely useful if you plan on going on in philosophy. Um, I'd highly encourage you to take symbolic logic. Uh, it's very difficult to go very far and do very well in philosophy without a background in symbolic logic. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's extremely interesting. And uh, it develops a lot of themes that you get inter introduced to uh, here. So uh, just keep that in mind. All right, arguments. So what I want to talk to you about today is just the makeup of arguments, what constitutes a good argument, um, and uh, some things that come up along the way. Uh, we should ask the question at the very beginning, why care about arguments? What's the point? What does it matter? Uh, well, you should think of arguments like vehicles, right? They're things that take you places. Um, with a good argument, you start with some set of true claims, and you're able to get to more true claims, right? And that's neat. Uh, if you've ever taken a geometry class, you've seen this in action, right? You start off with a handful of postulates, and you derive a huge number of theorems, um, all from that small collection. And you've done that by way of argument. You've started with some things, and you've learned a whole lot else besides. And it's the argument that's taking you from the starting points to the end points. Um, of course, it's not just in geometry. Uh, that you see this. Uh, we do it in everyday reasoning as well. Uh, any good uh, uh, legal television show demonstrates this in interesting ways, right? This is what lawyers are up to. They start from certain collections of data and they marshal arguments towards the guilt or innocence of an individual, right? They have their starting points and they show that given the starting points, given the data, given the premises, something else has to follow, or at least is extremely likely to follow, right? And that's really neat, right? We exonerate innocent people, and we um, uh, uh, the, the term of non-exoneration is uh, eluding me right now, uh, but uh, we indict and um, send to prison the guilty uh, on the basis of good arguments, right? Or hopefully good arguments. All right, so uh, what are the pieces of an argument? What are the pieces? Well, the pieces are statements. We talked about statements last time. Statements are expressed in declarative sentences. They're things like this. You're in a room. There's a ceiling over your head. So-and-so is the president of the United States, right? Just things that are either true or false and purport to represent the world as being a certain way. So statements. Um, do you have any questions about statements? We talked about them in a bit more detail last time. All right, good. Um, 
So all the pieces of an argument are statements. There's no piece of an argument that's not a statement. Okay? Um, but we distinguish two kinds of statement that occur in an argument. Um, there are the premises and then the conclusion. Uh, what makes the premises the premises? Well, what makes the premises the premises is that they're doing a certain job. Or they're performing a certain role. They've got a certain functional description. And their job description is that they provide, or at least are supposed to provide, support for the conclusion. Right? The premises and conclusion are both statements, or they're all statements. Um, but the difference between them is what's doing the supporting role, what's doing uh, the truth indicating role. Um, so sometimes we say that the reasons given in support of the claim are called the premises, and the thing that's supposed to be supported is the conclusion. Right. Not very sophisticated if you've looked at logic at all before. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, is this an argument? Religious people tend to live longer and have healthier lives than people who are not. Is this an argument? Right. Why don't you turn to the person next to you, issue your judgment. Is this an argument? All right, that's good enough. Easy question. Uh, so raise your hand if you think this is an argument. All right, some. Raise your hand if you think it's not. All right, most of you, uh, those who said not are correct. Uh, why do you say this is not an argument? All right, good. It's a statement. Right. Uh, what's in an argument? What are the pieces? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, premises and conclusion. What we have here is just a claim. There's no apparent premise. There's no apparent conclusion. We just have a statement. Right. This is uh, far short of an argument. Okay. Uh, what about this? Uh, religious people tend to live longer and health, have healthier lives than people who are not. Evidence for this comes from a study carried out in the U.S. in 98, which compared the health records of 50 people who attended church regularly with 50 people who did not. The study found that on average, the religious group lived an extra five years. All right. Now, uh, is this an argument? Right. So you, to have an argument, you have to have something with premises and conclusion. Uh, so the answer is yes. We have here an argument. Uh, here's a different question. Uh, what's, what are the premises? What are the what's the conclusion? All right, why don't you take a second, turn to the person next to you, issue your judgment there. All right, so uh, what's the conclusion? All right, good. Uh, live longer and have healthier lives right, than non-religious, so that's the complete conclusion. Uh, what are the premises? Well, it's the rest of it. Okay. Um, here's a question. All right, so that's just what I said. All right. Here's the thing you gotta, or at least we strongly urge you to do um, as you're doing philosophy, in general too, um, but uh, especially in philosophy where if, if the arguments can be quite subtle, um, it always helps to turn an argument into standard form. All right, so th there are some instructions uh, or rules for doing this that are provided in the reading that you were supposed to do for today. Uh, I'm not going to go over the rules. They're pretty straightforward. Um, 
they're kind of intuitive when you sort of see what this is, um, and it's pretty easy to get a handle on uh, how to transform a paragraph into this. But the very act of transforming a paragraph into this is extremely uh, useful for um, for assessing the argument, right? Uh, you want to specify what the conclusion is, throw it at the bottom, and you want to identify what the premises are. And the reason for the doing this is that uh, you want to be able to effectively evaluate the argument, and you can only effectively evaluate the argument if you've got a very clear understanding of what are the premises and what are the conclusion is. Okay, so let's let's talk about that assessment um, assessment of arguments. Uh, well, maybe I should pause. Uh, do you have any questions about standard form? All right. Uh, I urge you all in your writing uh, for this course, uh, work, try, try this out. Uh, we, we like to see this stuff. Uh, you don't have to construct your arguments in this way, but you'll construct better arguments if you do it. Okay. All right, so not all arguments are good, right? Plenty of bad arguments out there. Um, I mean, we're, we're good at reasoning, right? You can't live long on this earth and be very bad at reasoning, right? You got to know when not to cross the street, uh, you know, when you see cars moving at a certain speed in order to make it in an urban environment. Uh, that's an act of reasoning. Um, we reason all the time about all sorts of things. So we're not uh, bad reasoners, but we also make a lot of mistakes. And what we want to identify is, well, what, what are the mistakes? What makes a bit of reasoning good reasoning? All right. uh, what makes an argument successful or is even counter in um, studies of argumentation? Uh, we say what makes an argument sound or cogent? So the terms soundness, the term cogent is the term or terms we use to refer to good arguments, successful arguments, ones that are desirable. Okay. Uh, two bits. To uh, sound arguments, cogent arguments, um, the premises have to be true, and the premises have to support the conclusion, or put differently, uh, the conclusion has to follow from the premises. Right, two things, two different things. Um, when the conclusion follows from the premises, we give an argument, the term validity. We'll talk more about validity momentarily. Um, again, this is not a surprising feature uh, of an argument uh, that it should, uh, uh, this is not a surprising sort of criteria for a good argument. Right? Obviously, um, if you're going to get from somewhere, uh, from some set of truths to another truth, which is supposed to be the function of an argument, uh, you need to start off with a set of truths, right? Uh, and similarly, if you're going to get somewhere, right, <laughs> the, the, the starting place has to get you to the end place, right? So we need the follow through bit, the support bit. Okay. Um, when we talk of a conclusion following from uh, the premises, what we mean is that if the premises are all true, notice this is a conditional claim, if. If the premises are all true, then the conclusion is true. Um, excuse me, I, I misspoke. Uh, if the premises are all true, they provide good reason for thinking the conclusion is true. Um, what I characterized just a moment ago is a deductively uh, valid argument. We're moving towards that. Okay. Uh, there are different terms. Uh, I've used some of them already for noting this follow from business. We talk about support relations, entailment relations, implication relations. And all of this is just different ways of signaling the fact that you've got, in a good argument, premises, starting points, that do in fact get you to the end point. Right, let, me, let me illustrate a uh, failure here. Um, you're all in a room. Therefore, the earth will blow up tomorrow. Well, that's an argument, right? That's an argument. Um, now, it's a bad argument, and obviously it's a bad argument because the conclusion, the end point, 
the earth will blow up tomorrow, doesn't follow from the premise. Right? The premise doesn't support it. The fact that you're in a room has no bearing whatsoever on the destructive <laughs> future of the world. Okay. All right. Um, so we've got these two things, truth and validity, or the validity bit is the follow from bit. It's the support bit, it's the implication bit. Um, notice that these are independent criteria. That is, one can be satisfied without the other. Right? They don't go together. Right? They don't always travel together. All right, so uh, this is for you. Um, we've got two questions. We've got three arguments uh, with the person nearest to you. Uh, answer each pair of questions for each argument, okay? All right, uh, so let's see where you are at. Um, so number one, all tigers are mammals. All mammals are carnivores. Therefore, all tigers are carnivores. Uh, we've got two criteria for good argument, true premises, and premises that support the conclusion. Um, does argument number one have both? All right, I need, just need you guys to be participatory. Uh, all right, so nods of heads are all right, uh, but let's um, uh, raise hands maybe. All right, so. Uh, are the premises all true? So raise your hand if you think they're not all true. All right, great. Uh, which is the false premise? Yeah, good. Um, we're omnivores, right? And yet we're mammals. Uh, what about the second? Uh, do the premises support the conclusion? Uh, yes or no? Yep, great. They do, obviously. Uh, so we say that this is not a cogent argument. Right? It's not a sound argument because it's lacking one of the two criteria for being a cogent argument, for being a sound argument. Okay. Uh, what about the second? Uh, penguins are birds, and all birds lay eggs, therefore penguins lay eggs. Um, are all the premises true? Remember, we're being participatory. Uh, yeah, all right, good. Uh, that's enough head nods. Uh, do the premises support the conclusion? All right, good, good, good. All right, so what do we have? What kind of argument? Cogent, sound, or informally, a good one? Yep. And I jumped the gun there, but uh, had I not clicked that button, uh, we'd see that this is also not a cogent argument, because uh, the conclusion doesn't follow. Um, everybody pick up on that? Great. All right, here's a question for you. Um, if the conclusion of an argument is true, the argument is cogent. No. 
Yeah, no, why not? Good. So you can. All right, good. Very good. Uh, you can have an argument that has a true conclusion. The Earth uh, blew up yesterday, therefore you're here right now. All right, we've got an argument on our hands that has a true conclusion and has neither feature of a good argument. All right, conclusion doesn't follow. All right. The fact that the universe blew up yesterday doesn't imply that you're here right now. In fact, it would probably imply the opposite. Uh, and also, we have a false premise. Uh, happily, the Earth is still here. Okay. All right. Um, deductive validity. So there's two broad ways in which a set of premises can support a conclusion. Uh, deductively and inductively. Uh, deductive arguments are arguments that support their conclusion or arguments whose premises support the conclusion in a special way. Um, it's logically impossible for the premises of a deductive argument, a deductively valid argument, to be true and the conclusion false. All right. So here are some examples. Uh, you've already seen some uh, in the previous exercise we did. Uh, whoever the guilty person is, they are left-handed. Miss Green is not left-handed, therefore she is not guilty. All right. That's an argument whose premises support the conclusion. Uh, but they don't merely support it. They don't provide you with some reason uh, the premises guarantee that the conclusion is true, if the premises are true. Right? It's logically impossible. We get a contradiction if you assume that it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion of that argument to be false. Again, an argument you've seen a moment ago, all tigers are mammals, all mammals are carnivores, therefore all tigers are carnivores. Again, the premises cannot be true and the conclusion false. You'd get a contradiction. Okay. Deduct, deductive arguments are arguments that have this feature. Okay. Uh, again, so just to reiterate, if you've got a deductively valid argument, that is an argument whose premises support the conclusion deductively, it's logically impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Now this is, I think this is sexy, right? This, this, this ensures that if you've got a deductively valid argument on your hands, you can't be wrong about the conclusion if you're right about the premises, right? There's no risk of error. You can't make a mistake. I mean, that's, you know, if the purpose of an argument is to get you from truths to more truths, then this is the most desirable kind of argument, one that's guaranteed to get you to the place you want to go. That's what deductive arguments hold the promise of. Um, so maybe I went a bit fast in saying it's uh, obvious that if the premises of the arguments just given are true, the conclusion cannot be false. Uh, just pause for a second and appreciate it. All birds lay eggs. Penguins are birds, therefore penguins lay eggs. Uh, we say it's deductively valid because it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. And you can see that, right? Just suppose the premises are true. All birds lay eggs, penguins are birds. Now suppose the conclusion's false. Penguins do not lay eggs. Well, now we've got an inconsistent set of statements on our hands. Because if all b birds lay eggs and penguins are birds, then it follows that penguins lay eggs. And that's the contradictory of penguins do not lay eggs. Right? So this set is inconsistent. Uh, any questions about this notion of deduction? Um, you should know that uh, in the study of logic, we use the term deduction uh, in this very precise way to mean arguments whose premises are 
uh, guarantee the truth of the conclusion. This is not how Sherlock Holmes uses the term deduction. Uh, he uses it in a kind of loose way, right? He uses it to mean uh, something like it's you know, the best argument available or something. Uh, not all the arguments, he says, are, it's a matter of deduction about are in fact deductive arguments. Uh, many of his arguments are non-deductive. Um, so this is uh, a stipulative use of the term in the study of logic. All right, so here are some arguments. Well, I uh, messed up the order of this, but the point is still important. So Joe lives in Melbourne. He lives in Victoria. Joe doesn't live in Victoria, so Joe doesn't live in Melbourne. Here's another. Miss Green is the murderer. She would have to be left-handed, but she's not left-handed, so she cannot be the murderer. To pass this course, you must complete all the assignments, but you have not completed all the assignments. Therefore, you will not pass the course. We hope that's not a sound argument, right? <laughs> uh, has false premises. Um, Luke will be late for his meeting if he misses his plane, but he was not late for his meeting, so he cannot have missed his plane. All right, so the thing to appreciate here is that all of these have something in common. All right, what is it that they have in common? Well, you know, because I messed up the order of the appearance of things on this slide, that it's their form, it's their structure. Right, superficially, they seem a bit different, right? Different content, right? They're all about different things. And they're not even phrased in the same kind of way. But if you pause and reflect on the structure of the arguments, you see that they have something in common. And what they have in common is this abstract structure, this form. If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. Okay. Um, the notion of structure is central to deductive arguments. What makes deductive arguments what they are is the fact that they have a structure that ensures that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Right, this is a formal feature. Right, it, the content of the argument doesn't matter for validity. It's the structure of the argument. All right, and with a moment or two, we'd be able to see that each of these arguments has that structure, right? You, uh, to pass the course, you must complete all the assignments. You've not completed all the assignments, therefore you will not pass the course, right? We can just easily rephrase this so as to see that it has this particular structure. If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. If you pass the course, then you completed all the assignments. You did not complete all the assignments, therefore you did not pass the course. Right. Um, that's very obviously uh, an example of an argument with the structure depicted below. If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. Um, okay. Similarly here, uh, if we pause, we can see that it's very easy to reformulate this argument so that it explicitly has the form, if A, then B, not B, therefore not A. And again, this is a deductively valid argument. If the premises are true, the conclusion cannot fail to be true. The conclusion has to be true. Okay. Uh, we call this argument modus tollens. Uh, it means the way of negation. All right, focusing on the second premise, not B, right, the negation, the denial. Um, and obviously, the content, the, the, the values you assign for A and B don't matter. That is, it doesn't matter what sentence you plug in to the A part, it doesn't matter what sentence you plug in to the B part, no matter what, if an argument has that structure, it's going to be valid. It's going to be impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Um, 
There's an elegant way of demonstrating this formally, which you do in symbolic logic, and we will not do here because you know, it just take a bit more time. Uh, but you can intuitively appreciate that you just can't make good sense. Uh, you can't avoid contradiction uh, in taking the premises of such an argument to be true and the conclusion false. Uh, any questions about stuff up to this point? Uh, notion of structure, of form, how you can transform an argument so that it explicitly has a given structure. All right. Um, some argument forms masquerade as deductively valid forms, uh, but they're not. And you've got to be careful here. Um, it's very easy to make mistakes in deductive reasoning. And one very common mistake among novices uh, is what's called denying the antecedent. All right, so this, here we have an argument form. If A, then B. Not A, therefore not B. All right, so if that were deductively valid, that would mean it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. All right, but is that, in fact, the case with this argument form? Uh, a moment's reflection should allow you to see that that's not true of this argument form. The premises can be true and the conclusion yet false. Right, so here's one example. Uh, if Miranda lives in Melbourne, she lives in Victoria. Miranda does not live in Melbourne. Therefore, Miranda does not live in Victoria. Now, if I said that really quickly, that might sound like modus tollens, right? If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. But it's not. It's different, right? It's denying the antecedent. Um, I apologize. I haven't... Uh, antecedent uh, consequent. Are you guys familiar with these terms? So conditional statements are if-then statements. Uh, the first part of an if-then statement is the antecedent. The if A. Right. A is the antecedent. B is the consequent, if A then B. Right. A antecedent is what come first, comes first, consequent is what comes second. We call this denying the antecedent because you're denying what comes first in the conditional, if A then B. Um, all right, so here's a question. Do we have a contradiction in assuming the premises of this are true and the conclusion false? Can it be true? that if Miranda lives in Melbourne, she lives in Victoria. Miranda does not live in Melbourne. Right. Can both of those be true? And yet it be false that Miranda does not live in Victoria. Do we understand the question? Right? Deductively valid arguments are arguments where it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So we have this question, is denying the antecedent deductively valid? Well, it's only valid if it's impossible to have true premises and a false conclusion. So I'm asking you, is, it, is this possible in this case? Can the first two be true and the third, the conclusion, false? Why don't you just Register your thoughts with the person sitting nearest to you. Is it possible for the first two to be true and the conclusion false? All right, let's see where we're at. Uh, raise your hand if you feel like it's clear to you that you can have the true premises and a false conclusion here. All right, about half. Uh, is somebody who's confident, can you say why? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Good. Uh, it's true. You, you can't live in Melbourne and avoid living in Victoria. 
So if you live in Melbourne, you live in Victoria. Um, still, you might not live in Melbourne, right? You can be in rural Victoria, okay? Um, in which case, the conclusion's false, right? It's true that if you live in Melbourne, you live in Victoria. Uh, it can be true that you don't live in Melbourne, and yet false that you do not live in Victoria. You could live in Geelong, you could live in Ballarat, you can live in, all right, I've just exhausted my knowledge of Victoria almost, <laughs> not quite, um, but uh, I'm struggling. Um, all right, so uh, come up with your own example, all right? Uh, so with the person ne nearest to you, uh, come up with your own version of this, right? An argument that has this form and show, give the example for why it's not valid. All right, so if A then B, not A, therefore not B. All right, for the sake of time, uh, what's, is somebody uh, brave enough to share, <laughs> pardon me, uh, their example? And you can have true premises and a false conclusion because, yeah, you can play other sports. Fantastic. All right, so, um, good example. Um, there's another common uh, mistaken form of argument that, uh, uh, form of argument people mistake for a deductively valid form. Uh, it's called affirming the consequent. All right, so there's two up there. We've just discussed the second one. Um, now I want to say a word about the first one. It's called affirming the consequent. It goes like this. If A, then B. B, therefore A. Okay. Um, so that's like saying, well, we have an example here. If it's raining, the party will be canceled. The party was canceled, therefore it's raining. Why is that not a valid argument? Yeah, other reasons it could be canceled. So even though it might remain true that if it's raining, the party will be canceled. It might be an outdoor party, right? Outdoor parties often get canceled for rain. Um, and it can still be true that the party was canceled, and yet false that it was canceled because of rain, right? Um, everybody going to the party may have died in a, a bus accident, right? So the party got canceled, I don't know. Uh, that's bit uh, morbid, uh, I'm sorry. Um, all right. Uh, now, affirming the consequent is often confused not with modus tollens, right? If A, then B, not B, therefore not A, right? That's what denying the antecedent is often confused with. Uh, affirming the consequent is often confused with modus ponens. If A, then B, A, therefore B. Um, if it's raining, the party will be canceled. It is raining, therefore the party will be canceled. Right, that's a fine argument, but, but that's not affirming the consequent. Okay. Uh, 
There's other deductively valid argument forms. A logic is a really rich area of study. Um, can't possibly say everything interesting there is to be said about it. But uh, here, here are just a couple more argument forms that are common that are deductively valid. Okay. Uh, destructive syllogism goes like this. Either A or B, not B, therefore A. Right, if, you've got, if you know that one of two options obtains, right, things are either this way or that way, and you know that they're not one way, then you can conclude that they are the other way. And again, this is an argument form that has this really cool property. If the premises are true, conclusion cannot be false. The conclusion has to be true. Uh, hypothetical syllogism. Right, this is different. Uh, goes like this. Uh, if A, then B. If B, then C. Therefore, if A, then C. So if you're taking a philosophy class, then you're puzzled about something. If you're puzzled about something, then you're frustrated about something. So if you're taking a philosophy class, then you're frustrated about something. Deductively valid. It's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Uh, it's a bit more difficult to demonstrate why that form's deductively valid. You've got to take more logic to figure that out, but um, trust me, it is. And uh, it should sound good to you um, because you're all pretty good reasoners. No. Um, so the, the equal bit is ident an, ident an identity relation. Um, and uh, every identity relation does imply an if-then uh, relation. Uh, so, if, um, well, uh, identity relations are relations between objects. Um, here, A and B aren't objects, they're statements. Uh, so that's an important difference. Um, Leibniz's law says if two things are identical, so if object A, or let's say, object x is identical to object y, then everything true of x is true of y. And that's distinct from this. Um, yeah, so not, not quite. All right, I'm going to skip, skip some questions. Uh, there's a whole lot more in the slides for your perusal. Um, Earlier I said, and I remind you now, that there's two, two ways for a set of premises to support a conclusion. Uh, there's the deductive way, right? And the deductive way is really cool because it, it guarantees that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. That's not the only way to have a good argument. You can have an argument whose premises support the conclusion, but non-deductively. Right? We call these inductive arguments. Inductive. And what makes an inductive argument a good argument isn't the fact that it guarantees that if the premises are true, the conclusion is true. It's the fact that it guarantees this. If the premises are true, the conclusion is likely to be true. Right? It, it makes the conclusion probable to a sufficient extent. So here's one kind of example, um, so reasoning from just probabilities. Uh, if you know that the vast majority of nurses are women and, you and you're told that there's a nurse in the next room, uh, you can infer that that's a woman. Um, given that your knowledge that it's vastly likely that nurses are women. Um, of course, the, the probability can vary, right? It, it might be just barely more likely uh, that if someone's a nurse, then they're a woman, right? Because maybe only 55% of nurses are women. In which case, you've got a weak inductive argument, right? You've still got more reason to think the person in the next room is a woman than not. Uh, but you don't have a very strong reason to think the person in the next room is a woman. Um, you need the probability to be much higher, right? And that makes the inductive argument stronger. 
because it makes the conclusion much more likely to be true. Um, this isn't the only way of having an inductive argument. Um, I'm just going to concentrate with what moments I have left with you on uh, inferences to the best explanation, because I think these are uh, somewhat, these aren't forms of argument you're going to encounter in like, well, it anyway, doesn't matter. It's just the one I think is most interesting and relevant. Um, here's how inferences to the best explanation, uh, the, the idea is this. Um, Suppose you have some set of facts, and you've got a great explanation. In fact, an explanation for those facts that's better than any competing explanation. The thought here is that the fact that that explanation is better than all competing explanations is a good reason to think it's true. Let me give you an example. Suppose you and a friend go skiing. Uh, you Australians don't know too much about this, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know, maybe get out of the city. Um, has anybody not seen, no, I'm just, snow is just not a part of the life here. Um, but anyway, so, so you go skiing with a friend, uh, it's, uh, you know, a beautiful mountain view, uh, you know, you're alone on the slopes, um, it's midday, the, the valleys before you lit up beautifully, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, so you pause. Now, you, you're a better skier than your friend. And so you're, you're way ahead. Your, your friend's slow. Uh, so you're just waiting for them to catch up. And as you're gazing out on this valley and this, this beautiful scene, smack. You're hitting the back of the head with a snowball. Now what's your immediate thought going to be? My friend threw a snowball at me, right? Because you're alone on the mountain. He's behind you. You're looking forward. Uh, what you've just engaged in is a very quick bit of this kind of reasoning. You've made an inference to the best explanation. Right? Uh, how did that go? Well, there's a certain set of facts available to you. Right? You two are alone on the mountain. Your friend's behind you. Snowballs don't sort of up and throw themselves. Right? So if a snowball hits you, someone threw it. And the only explanation for who threw it at you is that your friend did it. Right? The kind of reasoning you've just engaged in is this sort. Uh, and the abstract structure of this kind of argument goes like this. If, uh, if H was true, or a hypothesis, um, just think claim, statement. Doesn't, don't put any weight on the term hypothesis. But um, if H was true, it would explain why D is true, where D is the data, right? The facts that you know are correct, like that you're on a mountain, that no one else is behind you, that snowballs don't throw themselves, that uh, you know, so that, that stuff. Um, H is the best or most plausible explanation, right? Again, that your friend threw the snowball is the best explanation of the scenario, and so you conclude that that's in fact true. Right? It's not deductive. You could be wrong. Right? There might be someone who likes to hit random skiers with snowballs on the mountain, and they just sort of camp out and wait for skiers to stop. That's a real possibility. You might be wrong. It might not be your friend who hit you in the back of the head with a snowball. Um, there might be someone further up the mountain with the snowball launching machine, right? And they take aim at skiers who stop. Um, Santa, right? there's all kinds of weird, hold on, no, no, no. this isn't, uh, I was bleeding into a different consideration, so hold the Santa thought. Right, but there are other plausible, the Santa explanation isn't plausible, but there are other explanations that could be true. Um, and uh, so you might be wrong that your friend did it. So this is not an, a deductive argument. It's inductive because the premises don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. They just make the truth of the conclusion much more likely. Right. This is the kind of argument you find most often in the Sherlock Holmes novels. This is the kind of argument you get most often on TV law shows. Uh, this is the kind of argument um, we often engage in. Uh, if you see, you know, a lot of, if you're walking down the street and you see an overhang and you see a lot of bird poop, poop like below, uh, you think there are birds who are there frequently. Why? Not because that's the only way for bird poop to get there, right? There might be a bird store around the corner and they just like to dump their bird crap. Um, but that's not especially likely. Uh, 
most likely scenario is that birds perch above. Right? It's inductive reasoning. It's an inference to the best explanation, and it's exceedingly common. Um, there are examples. Uh, I'm not going to go through them. I just gave you one. I think it's fun. Uh, but here are the questions to ask whenever you're, you've got an, induct, um, an inference of the best explanation on your hands. Uh, first question to ask is, is the data actually accurate? Right, because the manner of reasoning is like this. Uh, this set of facts is true, and this hypothesis explains this set of facts. It's the best explanation. Well, you've got to pause and ask, well, are the facts correct? Right? If they're not correct, then it doesn't matter if something explains them, because right? they're not true. So you have to double check. Uh, secondly, you want to know if there are, are alternative explanations. Right, so the, the bird poop scenario, right? One explanation, birds perch above. Second explanation, birds store around the corner, they like to dump their crap. Um, there's other alternative explanations, right? So what you, what you need to do when you're reasoning in this way is you need to come up with the full set of reasonable explanations, right? You don't just settle on the first one that comes to mind. You need to pause for a moment and get all the relevant ones on the table. And then uh, you want to assess just how plausible the candidate explanations are. So he here's where Santa Claus comes in, right? One, one explanation for how you get hit in the back of the head with a snowball is that Santa Claus was flying above and you've been naughty this year, okay? And he's tired of giving coal, so he's resorted to throwing things at people. Um, that's an explanation, uh, but it's, it's wildly implausible, right? Um, and this is what we do. Once we get all the candidate explanations, we start weeding out the implausible ones. Now, I'm not encouraging you to think of the most wildly implausible explanations every time you have a set of data to be explained, uh, but you need to engage in the same kind of reasoning you do as you do with the crazy hypotheses, the crazy explanations. You need to assess, well, which among the plausible explanations is best. Um, any, just because I have to let you go, any questions about this form of reasoning? All right, so uh, this is the introductory logic. I'm sure some of you probably had to take content in high school that covered some of this, so if you were excessively bored, I apologize. But, um, these are the basics, they're the fundamentals, and we're employing them left and right in doing philosophy. And if this kind of stuff, you know, gets you going, uh, we've got more classes in uh, philosophy that cover it in much more interesting detail, that cover issues that are not obvious about logic. So I'd encourage you to have a look at those courses. Um, see you guys in a few weeks. I really like is uh, Harry Gensler's introduction to logic. Harry Gensler. G E N L E R. Uh -huh. And um, it covers a lot of issues. It has a lot of examples. It has computer exercises. Um, what's really cool about his examples is that they're not mundane, like <laughs> if you know all mammals are, are carnivores, right? That's kind of boring. His examples are often philosophically loaded, so you learn a little bit of philosophy while you're learning logic. So that's, that's really fun. Uh, and I found that when I was an undergrad, it to be a really crystal clear uh, explanation for logic. Uh, it's, the one drawback is that uh, some of the, the, the symbols he uses um, 
aren't the symbols you'd probably encounter if you took symbolic logic with Lloyd. And so there'd be like a conversion experience that this happened. I mean, like, a, like you'd have to convert. Sorry.